You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 142. On today's show, I partner up with the world's number one lighting podcast, Light Talk. A group of lighting designers, educators, and Ellen, the creative director of Live Design, chat about the finance and business side of careers in entertainment lighting. They discuss unfair taxation, working for free, how to invest $10,000, investing to beat inflation, career financial mistakes, and dividend funds versus growth funds. Today's intro is a bit long, so to skip straight to the interview, jump to minute three. Without further ado, let's get to the show. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. What I love about today's episode is that these folks provide a variety of opinions. Now, you may sense that things start to get a bit testy, and that is what I love, love, love about this discussion. This is exactly why finance and business are often not talked about. Managing a creative career is complicated. It's laced with both low-paying jobs and high-paying jobs, which easily translates into emotions about self-worth as a creative and as a human being and about quality of life. Obviously, here at Artistic Finance, we think everyone in creative industries should reach financial stability while being able to work with passion, pride, and positivity. Yet achieving that is easier said than done. It requires a lot of education, self-realizations, and a lot of tough decisions. If you're a creative listening today, know that you are valuable both as a member of society and for the contributions that you bring to our fellow humans who experience your work. A lighting designer at any venue and in any form of content is contributing something to the world that only we can provide, and you are well worth the financial compensation that you receive for doing that work. Before we get to the episode, I'd like to provide an exciting update on the number of Apple podcast reviews we have. This week, we reached 44 reviews, which means we have finally overtaken Light Talk itself. Yes, you heard that right. Our longtime quest to take over Light Talk has happened. Now, remember, they don't know that we're doing this, <laughs> so it's slightly unfair, but it's also a lot of fun. So if you haven't reviewed Artistic Finance on Apple Podcasts, please go do it as sooner or later, Light Talk is going to realize that we have a feud and that's gonna make them push to reclaim the title. <laughs> now, you may wonder, why am I teaming up with Light Talk this week? If you've heard some of our recent episodes, you'll know that I am a freshly minted father. In order to spend more time with the baby, several collaborators have jumped in to host episodes of the show. Every one of the Lumen Brothers has been a guest on this show, and they kindly decided to devote one of their episodes entirely to talking finances so that I could rebroadcast it here. To find the previous episodes with each of the Lumen Brothers, look in the show notes for a link or merely search on your podcast app using their name plus Artistic Finance. So to find the episode with Steve Woods, type Steve Woods Artistic Finance and his episode will pop up in your podcast player. This is the last you'll hear from me for this episode. After this, it's just the Lumen Brothers and Sister. Please enjoy Light Talk.
Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Ellen coming to you from the tropical island of St. Bart's, and you are listening to Light Talk. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and you are listening to Light Talk. Yes, you are. This is David coming to you from the beautiful Stevenson Ranch neighborhood of Santa Clarita, California. Olé. And if you don't, <laughs> olé, baby. And if you don't olé, already know, you olé. are you are listening. Oy vey, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers and Sister. That's right, Ellen. Welcome everyone to episode three hundred and twelve. And today we have a very special show. Our good friend Ethan Steimel from Artistic Finance has asked the Lumen Brothers and Sisters to actually do a simulcast show that is going to be presented both on our show, which is. My talk with the Lumen Brothers and sister, and Ethan's show, which is artistic finance at a later date. So he's asked us to get together and talk just about money. Oh, my favorite subject. <laughs> I, I, I think he should change the name of the show. I like the Ethan show more than artistic finance. Just the Ethan show. How about Ethan's money? It should be really called other people's money, but... One time I posted one of his podcasts and I called it Artistic License. And he kind of liked it, but... <laughs> That's good. That's good, yep. too. Oh, there you go. I guess for some reason he really liked the uh, shows that we were on for him. And he thought like having us all together talking about money. And, you know, we're doing it just in time for tax season because I'm doing my income taxes right now. My my accountant's doing mine. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's smart. Mine, too. <laughs> you guys are a lot smarter than I am because I'm doing them myself. I've done my own. You never get caught. What it makes me, you never no, get no, caught. No, 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 I don't no. know how no, that you what's do happened, that. I was audited twice before. But when accountants did my my, my taxes, <laughs> now, I was that's audited. Not saying much. <laughs> and I said, wait a second. You know, because the IRS people say, you know, someone's really screwed this up. Where were you <laughs> doing this? Someone screwed this up. And so I've been doing it myself, but it's still a pain. It's And the older you get, the more difficult it gets. So anyway, we're going to be broadcasting this this Saturday. And so that gives everyone enough time to listen to this show and do the opposite of what we say. Because you don't want to follow... <laughs> Really wait a minute, wait a minute. This. My thing's worked out pretty well. I don't know. Stan, if you're going to take that liability right now, say, well, you know, <laughs> well, I have Stan insurance. K told me to do it this way. And then all of a sudden, no, 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 I would not give Stan any K. free advice. I'm just okay. saying, well, yeah, okay. my, my choice has worked out okay. You have insurance about being audited? You can be self insured if you have. If yeah, you the have problem a- is the IRS has so much power. And they're getting a lot more now. Yeah, and they can basically take everything and stop you from getting any money. They can basically take all of your finances away and future finances. It's almost as bad as getting a divorce, actually. And maybe it's worse, actually, <laughs> than some people. But that being said, I must say we are not professional CPAs. We are not professional uh, tax experts. So whatever we say today, take it with a big grain of salt, all right? You, so, you putting, what, wait, wait. You're putting in a disclaimer. <laughs> about out exactly but that's a big conversation do you think you just shielded yourself from somebody saying hey david said i should use turbo tax and i did and now i'm being audited (laughs) we're gonna get mad at you (laughs) let them get mad at me but at least i'll have something that's not (laughs) one of our questions it's okay no it's not and why don't we get started with the questions (laughs) and these are questions by the way that we've collected over the years and we decided to get like the best six or seven questions and talk about them today so uh let's get started stan has our very first question what's a mistake you made that hurt your career whoo i thought about this for about six seconds and i got my one word answer or one sentence answer not going into architecture sooner. And why is that? Because it pays. <laughs> so your advice, as far as finance is concerned, is to like do something that pays money. <laughs> well, no, Don't do theater. No, but, no, he's asked what a mistake. So, okay, I'll tell the story. Well, this is, wait, wait a second. Remember, this is a financial right. episode. Well, I don't think we need the story. I just think that the answer here in, in Steve's in Stan's case is actually diversify. So, what go. hurts your career is not diversifying from the from the get go. Um, I think we've heard other people say that in the past, 
And I think it's really important so that if something happens and the bottom falls out of one of your areas, that the other areas might thrive. So diversification, I think, is uh, a good safeguard against hurting your but career. I didn't make that mistake. I mean, but you I didn't did diversify diver- early enough. Well, I, I, I did. Yeah, well, I did diversify. I've always been diversified or had a diversified interest. How do we, how, what would be the right words here? <laughs> I, I have a diversifiedistic sensibility, but there were so few places to sort of work with light when I started that really there weren't a lot of choices. I think my mistake when I was young was not knowing how to pick a school to go to, you know, how how do you pick a school to get your undergraduate degree? So I went to a fine school, nothing wrong with it, but there's so many schools that are really good in training theater people. And I just didn't know anything about that. And I, I, so for me, it was, I, uh, you know, shot myself in the foot a little bit by not going to, to, I don't know, a North Carolina school for the arts or a Cincinnati with their undergraduate program. So that I think that stymied my career for a while. Well, I have a question for all of you guys. Did you all go into teaching to augment your career? Was it a financial decision? What, what happened there? I just liked, I always liked it. I was always in academia. I was always either working as a staff member, but I really did enjoy the intellectual stimulation of the academy. And I think that's because I was diverse. I mean, I did a lot of other things besides theater. I did ceramics. I did, you know, industrial arts. I did woodworking. I did painting. I did so many different things. And so the academia allowed me to have that sort of um, diversity, if you will. But I think I, I think when I ended up just in the theater department, I feel a bit restrained. My colleagues, when I started doing working in museums, my colleagues were like, "What are you doing in museums? That's nothing to do with theater." And I said, "Wait a minute." I'm doing lighting in museums. We're telling stories. We're sh- I just didn't have actors. So I think for me, it'll, it, it was not for, the money was, a, it was nice and the stability, but it, I really do like that st- intellectual stimulation. You know, Stan, this is a big problem in academia and especially in theater departments. And I've come across it. I came across it at SMU, as a matter of fact, when I was teaching there, is that people think that if you're not just lighting for theater, then you're pretty much worthless to them. Yeah, that's and wrong. they don't understand that the lighting industry is such a wide, diverse industry where you could do museums, you could do opera, you could do ballet, you can do, you know, all this stuff. But for some reason, some people think that, you know, hey, this person's very successful, but they're doing opera or they're doing architecture or whatever, where it's all lighting design. Right. But hopefully people will be have a little more open minds about that now. I'm not a purist. A little bit of that, I think, is people protecting their territory. So why would you want to go to that department to do something? You know, you're hired to do this. You know, I'm I'm entering into Stan's world a little bit more and more. And, you know, uh, you know, I had uh, some people who looked at me like I had grown a second head. Uh, (laughs) And then I said, well, this is what I'm getting paid. I'm I'm about to light 20 support structures. Uh, that hold up bridges over interstates. And and these are going to be turned into artwork and poetry and sculpture and things like that. And everyone's going, well, I can't believe you're doing that. That's just like, didn't you go to Granger? I mean, <laughs> oh, God. I have no idea what's involved <laughs> right. in that. No, that's, I'm not that's going to. A, gr- that's, that's a mess. Right. Yeah. Wow. And I, I think we just have to do it. I mean, we have to, to survive. You know, we're talking about finance here. You know, not only do we love doing what we do, and, you know, Stan loves doing architecture. I love doing architecture when I did a lot of it. Uh, it doesn't matter for them, but it's important to us because we're, we're opening up and we're able to make more money and be able to survive because God knows theater doesn't pay it. So um, I, well, that's the, that's I think the that's, thing. Does that yeah. mean Stan gets the honorary fez for the, today? The correct <laughs> answer to the question is uh, avoiding... <laughs> <laughs> avoiding diversification because you just don't know how or you've never thought of it is is diversification the thing that really kills us early in our career well lack thereof i mean i didn't want to be a, a costume designer or a set designer i didn't have talent the diversification piece we cannot overstate it 
um, because the other thing, as we've said before, is not sustainable. Unless, of course, you're a Broadway designer that has a show that runs for 25 years. Right. That's right. Yeah, and, and that's and, one in 500, you know, right. or more. Right, right. And that's if, that, if, that's your, if that's what you've got to have because your ego is of that size, then good luck. I wish you luck. Well, I mean, let's just face it. There are people like Ken Billington who have really made their career doing Broadway lighting. There well, are absolutely, people. No question. Absolutely. And some people will. But that's a tiny, tiny fraction. Right. Right. That's the point. If you it, it, and some, you know, not everybody's going to be Dustin Hoffman either. He made it right. Over. Right. Right. All right. So this question is kind of odd. It's what's the number one skill to have to be hired now? Well, clearly that depends what job you're applying for. Um, you know, I, I think uh, what are we talking about as a lighting designer or as a programmer or as a social media maven? What you know, I, I think it depends what job you're looking for. Um, I think Stan's um, designers that have um, his student designers who have strong design um, skills um, and are going to go work in the architectural world with Steve Rosen are, um, you know, they're clearly going to take those design skills. So that's their number one thing that they needed to be hired for that internship, which may turn into a, a job. If you're a programmer, I think the number one thing is to know to program as many different consoles as competently as possible. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Here's the skill I think that, that is the most important beyond all of those other things in any field. But well, we now have a term for it. It's called soft skills. The soft <laughs> skills are everything. You mean people skills? Yeah, that's what we used to call it in another era. But we, it, I think it's when we say soft skills now, it's more enlarged. Right. But it's it's being emotionally sensitive. It's have, being able to read the room. It's being joyful. It's it's um, being a positive energy, being the guy who's going to solve the problem, being somebody you want to go have the beer with. A lot of people can have skills, but there's a there's a set of particularly in our field, um, in the design fields, I think the soft skills play a really, really important role. And some some of that can be trained and some of that's natural, I think. Yeah, but if you don't have it, you're not going to make it. And one of the soft skills is to be proactive and actually <laughs> work to get your opportunities. You're not going to get any opportunities if you just sit on your hands and you're not going to go out and find out who's coming to town and meeting them and you know watching them focus a show and and actually be able to be social with them, you know, so that you know you can be part of it. You can be part of the scene. It's just very difficult. I mean, we all know we said it a thousand times on the show. The people that hire you are directors. If you're doing theater or any live entertainment sort of situation, they're usually directors. And a director's not going to hire you with a resume. It's not going to happen. So you need to meet these people. Somehow you need to get on their radar. And then, you know, work for free if you have to, just to start to get known. But don't wait for someone to come and give you a call. No one's going to call you. Yeah, but I think work for free has gone out the window. I don't think anyone accepts that as an option anymore. Well, I'm not saying work every gig for free. But if, you're, if you've got an opportunity to meet a director who is a, is a real, you know, is a, a, a up-and-coming director or, is, or someone who's established, then, you know, they're not going to hire you if you don't have a career ready. So go and figure out a way to get to know them, to be a part of that world. Or else you're going to be sitting on your on, on your butt all day long in, in your uh, living room, wondering, when, when is that phone going to ring? Ain't going to happen. Well, I think work for free has some nuance to it. And, and, and that nuance is um, you're 16 years old and you've only worked on an ETC console at the high school and your church or the church near you has a random A. And you go there and say, I'd like to learn you know, to program on your console. And you're willing to do a few services there for free to get your hands on a grand MA. You know, I'm not suggesting anyone call up, I don't know, Cincinnati Ballet and say, I'll be your lighting designer for a year and I'll pay you to let no, me work we're there. Not, I'm not saying that right. at all. Right. I'm, talking, well, about, I'm not talking about a high school student either. I'm talking about, you know, a graduate student or an undergraduate student who is living in a town when shows come in and, and they, they, they're not going to get hired as assistants. They don't have the experience or they're not known. So you find out if there's a way that you can shadow someone. I'm not saying all the time, but this is how you meet people. An interesting thing came up yesterday on uh, Facebook where a theater company, and I honestly forget where, was advertising for summer interns 
And the deal was free housing and $1,000 a month stipend. And people jumped all over them, saying that is lower than minimum wage in that state. You can't do that. Um, it's just not, you know, it's an insult. Uh, it was not accepted. Um, I think people, you know, um, are, are, are um, reacting badly against underpaid, low-paid jobs. And it's interesting that all of the things that are posted on a lot of these websites about jobs now, especially the stagehand stuff, there has to be an hourly rate or you can't post it. I agree with you. I mean, I think that's a sea change in the attitude of this generation. And, you know, if you don't do it, someone else is going to do it. So if, if you want a career in this business, you have to do whatever you can to meet these people, whatever it takes to meet these people. And you've got to be a nice person to do it. You know, you, you got to prove them that, you, that they may want to work with you. That's the way the business works. I think you guys are talking about two different things. Um, Elaine McCarthy's coming to town to do a show. And my students, with her permission, are going to come to the theater and they're going to sit quietly behind her and watch her work. And who knows, they might get her a cup of coffee or they might take a note for her. So, I mean, for me, that is working for free. You're there, you're observing a great designer, you're having a conversation. Um, and I get where you're coming from, Ellen. I, I understand this. The Some of the theaters out there that are sweat camps um, or sweatshops, you know, I know what you mean. But I, but I think there's an opportunity. If I had an opportunity to go watch, uh, back in the day, Bill Clage's work, I would have jumped all over that and not expected, you know, and I don't think he would have expected me to come and uh, move boxes and hang lights for a week for free. But I would have done anything to sit in the room with him. But I think there's a difference between sitting in the room with him and working for free. Yeah, can I, I want to get back to, Steve is, is hitting the nail on the head for me. And he said it in his first comment, he used the word nuance. And I think that that's correct. And there's the, we're living in an age where nuance is kind of dead. So, and since the show is supposed to focus on finance and money, let me put a finer point on it. I think I agree with, more with Steve than I agree with David on this one, in that there is an investment of time and when, if you're going to invest your time without financial compensation, you have to weigh whether there's going to be an ROI, everybody knows what that means, or return on investment. So working for free for an environment or a venue or a client where nothing really is likely to come from that investment in time, that's probably, an, even though you can't always tell, granted, sometimes there are surprises, versus in making an investment of your time in something where there is a higher likelihood of something coming from that investment in time. So hanging out with Bill Clagius or Elaine McCarthy has a higher probability of something coming from that time investment than coming to work for me in Gainesville, for example. There's just a the difference, right? And so I think you've got to be more savvy in terms of the choices about how you're going to invest your time and whether you think there's going to be a reasonable return on that investment. That's a good point, but, and then, and we actually agree with each other. The problem <laughs> is then if you have nothing else, there is a guaranteed zero ROI. If you don't go out and do it and, and meet these people. Can't argue with that. Again, it depends on what you want. I know if I wanted to be a Broadway designer, I would be living in New York. I would be going to the bars where all the, the all the designers hang out. I would be joining organizations. I would be working calls. I'd be doing anything, anything, to be in that theater where okay. those designers were. Let me let me counter this for a moment with Ethan. Let's bring Ethan into the room for a second. I will never forget when we were on his show. Well, he was on our show, and I asked him this question, and it just came to me, and I said. Ethan has been in New York for 10 years as a freelance designer, right? Smart, talented, well-trained, everything, right? Should be doing great. Got married, having a baby, and I asked him, Ethan, is being a freelance line designer in New York sustainable? Remember that? He had a one-word answer, which was no. <laughs> so that's just, let that reality just sink in, folks. Well, it may not have been sustainable for him, but it is for some people. 
Well, if you if, if you come from wealth, maybe if you come from wealth, I don't know. Well, I don't know. It's well, no, I mean, you know, there are the exceptions. I mentioned Ken Billington. There's certainly Don Holder. There's certainly Rick Fisher. There's D- David Hersey. I mean, there are, you know. Yes, but that's again, what percentage of of people are, are those guys? They like hit the lottery. They're lottery winners, and God bless them. And God bless them. Yeah, I think they worked for it. I don't know if the percentages matter. I think, I mean, I'm looking at these questions and I'm wondering if every answer goes back to diversification. It does. You know, and I've, ta- I've talked to Ethan about that a little bit. And, uh, and I agree, he does say no. But he also puts a caveat on that. And that is, you have to be uh, not a freelance designer for theater. Right. You have to do That's everything. Right. That's You've right. got to do everything that comes your way that allows you to practice your craft. Yep. And then then it is sustainable. Oh, let me just cut to the chase. Diversification. Um, what's a choice you made that benefited your career? Diversification. You know, I was working in theater and an opportunity came up to do opera. I thought, well, I've never done opera, but I've done theater. How How much different can it be? And then an opportunity came up to do dance and an opportunity came up to do um uh, rock and roll and an opportunity came up to do fashion shows. Uh, so having that real skill set as a designer and realizing it's all, it's, it's just lights. And once you understand how to manipulate those lights, it doesn't matter what you're doing. They all have the same attributes you, and you, you just explore that area. So I, for me, it is diversification. It is not, growing up and saying, well, I'm only going to do dance. I'm only going to do Shakespeare. I mean, that is just a career ender right there. Or maybe you're happy. Maybe you're happy, you know, doing that. It's certainly difficult to sustain a career when you decide 10 things are off your plate. And I find that through diversification, I'm a stronger designer because I'm meeting people who have different ideas than I do and different aesthetics and different points of view. Um. You know, it's like me and my little interstate that I'm lighting. I can't imagine doing that 20 years ago. I can imagine doing it now. I love it. And, you know, can I just say my answer was the same diversification, but then I put a big and in capital letters, bringing it back home to money. Always have a cushion and never spend your principal. Yes, but you're getting ahead of yourself because we're talking about people getting into the industry. They don't have a cushion or right. principal. Oh, come on. Right. Even no, when, that- you're, when, I, when I was 20, I had a cushion. I had $500 in the bank. I, oh, I never spent more than I made, even when I was a kid, because I was so afraid of having nothing or having an emergency. So you can, you, even when I got an allowance, if I got a dollar a week, I didn't <laughs> spend it all. You can always have a cushion. And then eventually you start getting some interest. That's your little bank account. And you don't spend the principal, you spend the interest. And that, and that habit, that habit, just let, you keep that habit. I'm working with my students now. And, you know, they all look at me and they kind of roll their eyes. And then maybe, maybe it sinks in. Um, start, start saving now while you're in grad right. school. And everyone Absolutely. goes, oh, I don't have any money. I don't have any money. Well, Drink one less cup of Starbucks a week. That's you can, right. You can go down to bank, not, what is it, uh, Fidelity. You can go to Fidelity and you can open an account with zero money in it. And you can mm-hmm. just have them draft $5 a week. And at mm-hmm. some point, that $5 a week, you know, you're, you're going to save 250 some odd dollars, $260 a year. But at some point, you're so used to that $5 disappearing from your paycheck every week, you don't even think about it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I preach the gospel of someday that $5 a week is going to be 50 a week. And then someday it's going to be 100 a week. But once you start saving and you do it at a realistic pace and you put in, mm-hmm. it doesn't do any good to put in $100 when you're only taking home 110 That's not sustainable. <laughs> But if you can put a couple bucks a week in until you, and you increase it as um, as you come to realize how much money you need every week to be happy. You know, everyone goes, you know, I, I can't have enough money. Well, maybe, I don't know, we'll take an arbitrary figure. Let's say $20,000 is going to make you happy or $100,000 is going to make you happy. Once you achieve happiness, 
what's the point of the money? You know, are you just buying crap that you're putting in your garage and throwing away and wasting your money? You you start saving and investing it very slowly, and and you know that's that's how it's done. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you, Steve. Perfectly said. What's your biggest fear that's holding you back from the next step in your career? Ha. For me, this I'm supposed to answer this for me. I certainly went through a period, given that I grew up in New York, surrounded by all these really successful people. Um, of having imposter syndrome and, and thinking that I wasn't good enough uh, at some level, maybe not consciously, but you know, not really recognizing my own ability or talent or worth. And, and uh, I think that held me back for a long time, particularly in the New York market. I was afraid because I didn't think, oh, these people are doing it longer than me. They know it better than me. They have more you know, accolades and awards and credentials than me. So could I ever really be that? So I think that held me back. I, and I also, um, in my particular case, you know, I had an illness that I didn't know I had. So I didn't have the energy that a normal person had. So there was two factors. But what changed it for me was moving to a smaller place. And when I was in a smaller place, people were like, wow, you're really good at this. And I went, you think so? And they said, yeah, you're like one of the best people around. And I went, really? So I think it's big fish, small pond, small pond, big fish, you know, kind of syndrome. So I think those things growing up in a in a big pond and I was a small fish and then moving to a smaller pond and I was a bit of a bigger fish. And so that those kinds of dynamics, I think, impacted my career. Self-confidence. Um, you really need to develop that um, no matter what step you are in your career, especially if you want to go into new directions or move up, uh, you know, to another position, you have to really, um, mm -hmm. believe in yourself. So that's a good point. You know, that's really interesting because I'm reading a book now. It's a biography on Leon Russell. He was a teenager in uh, Tulsa when he decided to move to LA to basically be a studio musician. And uh, he became one of the greatest studio musicians. He was part of the uh, Wrecking Crew back in the 60s. And uh, the Wrecking Crew, by the way, was the studio musicians in L.A. that basically performed on every hit that went out of L.A., including the Beach Boys and Jan and Dean and, and Phil Spector, all the Phil Spector stuff. All the musicians were, were the, um, the Wrecking Crew, which also included people like Glenn Campbell and Hal Blaine and people like that. But anyway, he said... Uh, in this biography, he was talking about this, about, you know, that he was, even though he grew up with uh, with uh, cerebral palsy, he, he basically was uh, uh, partially uh, paralyzed on one side of his body, he was able to overcome it. And he knew that he played well, even though, <laughs> even though he had this disability. I was reading that part of it and I was saying, wow, you know, that's really, really apropos to everything we do as artists. That if you, and it's basically what Ellen just said, if you don't have that confidence, you know, and, and, and he had stage fright. He overcame stage fright. He had stage fright his entire life. Uh, so I, I, you know, everybody does it differently, but I believe that if you're not confident, then you're not really going to make a very, very good impression, no matter how good you are. You have to have that personality. And I'm not saying cocky. I'm just saying, you know, being able to make decisions and make them fast and feel and make and make them bold. And I think then, you know, people are going to be uh, very successful. Right. Um, so here's a really sort of question. If it's too personal, don't answer it. But why are you a lighting designer and not a studio musician? Well, I was both for many years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, it's interesting because, uh, you know, the next question has to do with that, that. What's the best financial move you ever made? A lot of it was finance, actually. To me, music and lighting was the same. I mean, it's just, you know, one's a visual form of expression. The other one's an oral form of expression. I just went with what, wherever the opportunities were. And it just happened to move into lighting. But I still got a great deal of enjoyment from both. It's tough, you know, uh, this subject, you know, but not everybody has, you know, you never know what's inside someone and what their life experience has been. So it's one thing to say, have confidence, build confidence, but sometimes it takes time. Sometimes, it, and from in my case, I think it took me to be really confessional and honest here. It took me a bunch of successes before I could really believe in myself. So sometimes, the, a teacher or a mentor or a friend 
has to create the conditions under which you can succeed so that you start to believe in yourself. It's, it's not like a switch that you can just turn on. It takes time, and it takes the, re- the external world sort of validating you. And so I, I think it's a, tough, it's a tough one and an important one. Interrupting the show to mention a couple of things. A reminder that our Financial Independence Book Club is meeting this upcoming Sunday, April 23rd. This month's book is The Little Book of Common Sense Investing by Jack Bogle. We will connect via Zoom to discuss it. Now, I love seeing people at the book club, so even if you don't have time to read the book, please stop by and see us and hear what we learn from the book. To find links and details, visit artisticfinance.com slash book club. The next thing I'd like to mention is that today is the last day to win a travel mug, notepad, or a session on a lighting previs station brought to you by the Sovereign Candle Collective. All you need to do is go to Instagram and like at Sovereign Candle, at Utopia Dreamscape, and at Artistic Finance. And then comment what your favorite part of last month's book club was. We discussed the book Get Good With Money back on episode 139. Now that has been my favorite book so far because it has a ton of actionable advice. The last thing I want to mention is the Artistic Finance Patreon page. We have 32 patrons who have committed financial pledges every month. If you're finding value in the work that we're doing here at Artistic Finance, you can join up as a patron starting as little as $5 a month. Now, all patrons get early releases of episodes and a private podcast feed. This week, we have early Patreon episodes that include three episodes in collaboration with Theater Art Life. They are interviews about entertainment careers with LA-based costume designer Jessica Champagne Hansen, the managing director for Center Theater Group, Camille Schenken, the lighting designer of Kimberly Akimbo, Jeanette Oisak Yu, and former lighting designer, now provost of Baruch College, Linda Essig. To hear those episodes, check out the Theater Art Life podcast or sign up as an Artistic Finance patron, and you can do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Thank you again to the patrons who make this show possible. And now, back to the show. Okay, the next question is... What was the best financial move that you ever made? Well, the best financial move. <laughs> I don't know if I made the move because of finances, but I certainly made it because it was an opportunity. And that is when I started to teach. At the time, I was working for Disney and as a consultant, and I was doing a lot of great work there, but I really grew to hate it. You know, I did not like working for in that corporate world, um, <clears throat> especially that corporate world. And this was back, way back in the, uh, I believe it was in the uh, 80s, the late 80s. And I got an opportunity to substitute, to be a replacement professor for Joe Appelt. Remember Joe? Mm-hmm. Uh, from uh, Northwestern. Uh, UMKC. Okay. Yeah, no, UMKC. And he, he later Northwestern. He went to Northwestern after UMKC. And, uh, and I went out there. I never taught before. And I really enjoyed it. I, I just needed to get away. I mean, there was a lot going on in my life at the time, and that was a great opportunity for me to get away. So I did. And I actually worked three days in Orlando for Disney and four days in Kansas City teaching and uh, looking at uh, rehearsals and did that every single week. You can imagine flying back and forth from 90 degree weather and 100% humidity to like, you know, 20 below zero (laughs) on some days. It was pretty intense. But uh, I really grew to love teaching and it was also a steady paycheck. And then I went right after that to SMU and and, uh, taught there for what, eight, nine years. And um, and I, I just really enjoyed it. But what it was what it allowed me to do was give me financial security. And then finally, coming out here, I was actually at a place that had a pension. So now, when I retire, which is very, very soon, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to be okay. I don't have to worry about anything. By the way, it just reminded me of something I wanted to say earlier about uh, uh, saving money. One thing you definitely want to do if you're a young person right now, and that is start an IRA. You know, start a retirement plan because I really doubt that Social Security is going to be around uh, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Uh, I, I, I think you have to take care of yourself and it's never too soon to start. 
So that's a really, really important thing. How about you all? Uh, what, what was the best financial moves you made? Well, I'm, I have to say, um, I would agree with you. The, I, uh, you know, I was on the road quite a bit and the year prior to getting married, I was on the road 50 weeks out of 50. And I thought this is unsustainable. And also if I'm getting married, you know, what, what's the point of being on the road 30, 40 weeks out of the year? So for me, it was looking at uh, a career in education so that I didn't have to take every job that came my way. I could cherry pick what I wanted to do. And I think, you know, you talk about pension and IRA, IRA and Roth and all that stuff. The other thing that um, is problematic for people is health insurance. Mm -hmm. And so at being part of an organization that uh, pays health insurance, that's a huge, huge uh, kind of hidden asset that people don't think about. Uh, that's right. So I, I think, you know, for me, you know, I've got the factory job down at the university, and that is taking care of me and giving me an opportunity to do what I want to do and is preparing for when I retire. I uh, I think the question was, what's the best financial decision we ever made? I ever made. Is that the question? Sure. And that, for me, yeah. that financial decision was, you know, to look at something that could sustain me right. artistically and creative, creatively and, and financially. And so I've got the best of both worlds. He did. So I'll answer a question a little bit differently. So I just want to back up to something David said about the IRA. If you're a freelancer, the IRA has a limitation to how much you can put away each year. I think this year it's $7,500 uh, because I had a good year this year. I have to open something called the SEP, which is a self-employment pension, which rather than give it to the government will let me invest up to $61,000 a year. Uh, in a SEP, similar to an IRA, but for, it's for, if you're self-employed. So there's IRAs and SEPs. So SEPs I'm putting out there for people to think about. When you reach 72, you have to start taking money out of your SEP, no matter what you do. Right. You'll require distributions, but I'll, I'll be I, right. I will be taking money out of the SEP before that, for sure. But, okay. but, uh, but the best financial decision I ever made was based on a relationship. So there's two layers to this, to this answer. One is, if you make a friend... And that friend is somebody who you really value. Hold on to them like they're a precious gem because you never know how that's going to work out. And I have a friend from kindergarten. That's how long we go back. Ended up very successful. About nine years ago, after retiring from some pretty big companies, Hewlett Packard and others in the healthcare field, decided he was going to go into venture capitalism. And he said, we're going to do this fund, and here's how we're going to do it, and it's really unique, and let me know if you're interested. And frankly, I didn't really have enough money to invest in that kind of thing. But he said, well, we're doing it in installments, so it's going to be X number of dollars for five years. Every year, you're going to put in this much. At the end of five years, we're going to start to then sell our investments. And so it's a 10-year plan. That sounds like a long time. And I looked at that number and I said to my wife, can we really squeeze out that much money every year for the next five years? And, and he said, this is high risk, high reward. You could lose it all or not. But because I had such trust and, at, and we're friends for so long, if I ever was going to take a high risk, I would risk it with the friend I've had for 50 years. Yeah, well, a lot of people were friends with Bernie Madoff, too. I'm not sure I would give that advice to anybody I know. There's always, always going to be another side to the coin, but I'm answering the question. Okay, so we made that decision. We're now at the 11th year. We have received all of our principal back, and we still have a considerable amount of equity to be distributed because they could only extend it to 12 years. So it was the best decision investment was I've ever made the highest risk and it has been the highest reward. But the lesson is I don't know how many people who gave Bernie their money were friends with him since kindergarten and knew him inside out and spent time at his house and, and played in the schoolyard with him. There's, I think there's a difference between somebody who you say is your deal friend, I, I don't, deal friends and yeah, real I, yeah. friends. Deal I'm friends not and sure I would advise anyone to make a financial. I would not. What's that? Financial that investment one. based on their kindergarten friends. Sorry. They it could wasn't be based they on, could no, be whoa, 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 whoa. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that was not the whoa, whoa, whoa. That was not the basis of the decision. That was the we basis. We just said it was. No, that's the basis of the trust, okay, of trusting someone. Okay. Yeah, but, but the decision I mean, Bernie Madoff is a great, but, he screwed finish. his best let friends. Let me finish. But the decision was based on the business plan. That's objective. So we have, okay, good, but, we have good objective concept in the venture capital venture. It was morally a good thing to do in terms of what we were funding. And I had to trust. So it's never, I would, it's never one factor, Ellen. I would, I think I would never advise. But with the, with the extremely high risk, you do have to remind everyone that they have to be able to lose that money. That's correct. That's right. It's like walking into a casino and saying, okay, how much money can you afford to to wash down the drain tonight? That's correct. hundred dollars. Last me two minutes. (laughs) I used used to say, you know, in the old days, I used to say that I liked a pay phone better than a slot machine because at least you put a quarter in it you got a dial tone <laughs> right you know no i agree with um, we we went in with our eyes i could wide never open. i would never high risk is not i mean yeah. my well i think never. that stan's point is that he didn't take his lifelong friend out to the casino and put i put it all on black seven no, no this, but the guy had a business plan but business plan but it could have totally backfired yes and, and he, stan could have he, lost that, that even, money so you have to be psychologically and financially prepared to lose right. that if it's not i have never invested in anything that's not fdic insured exactly. and silicon valley right. bank this month was a really good example it, of that I could have so lost let me, let me ask you how do you how do you not, not you personally but hang on a second metaphorically how do you decide to take a risk you know, I can go down to the bank and get three percent return on my money in in a savings account, and that's five percent now. Five and that, has, oh, that, has, that has no risk at all. So how right. do you how I'll do you make you. a decision? I'm going to tell you to take risk. I'm going to answer Steve's question. Go for question. it. Go for it. I, I, very simple terms. I had a project. It had a very healthy fee. It was a it was a fee and a product I never expected to have in my life. Okay, I never thought I was going to have that money. So I didn't expect it to come in. So it was sort of a windfall. I had to work for it, but it was a bit of a windfall. So I thought, you know what? If we lose it all, it's okay, because I never expected to have it in the first place. Okay? So, and so that was, I was willing to, uh, cycle, to Ellen's point, if we, we were prepared to lose it. I also invested in, a, in an off-Broadway show, and I lost the money. But I was prepared to lose that. But that was a much smaller amount. Okay? But it still hurt. Right? And it would have hurt like hell if we had lost that. But it wasn't money. Was that, that was... the Huff and Puffs or whatever it was? Yeah. <laughs> Huffs and Puffs. Well, you know, it's just the, I, I kind of agree with Ellen on this one. Uh, what was his name? Alex Murdoff. A lot of people knew him from, from uh, elementary school, too. Right, Thought right. that he was the nicest guy in the world. And what does he end up doing, right? Uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars stolen. Stan also did say something that is really good, solid advice, which is never spend your principal. So if you had like a windfall of $100,000 or $200,000 or whatever it was, damn, invest it. Even if you're making 2%, don't go give it to the guy down the street who's got some possible losses. No, which brings us, which brings me to another Mm -hmm. money point that we should make on the show that people are not conscious of. Even here, we negotiate salaries at the university, which I participate in. The concept, people should understand the concept of purchasing power. Okay, and a lot of people, I'm sure everybody on this podcast gets it, but a lot of people don't. So what that means is that if inflation is at 2% and you have the money in the bank and it's earning 1.5%, that means you're losing half a percent of of that dollar's ability to buy a slice of pizza. The slice of pizza just went up for you. So you have to at least be flat in terms of what your money is earning or more. Right, so if inflation is eight percent, and you got your money sitting in a checking account at zero or zero point zero one, where mine was, you are losing money. So purchasing power is important. If you don't, if your if your savings is not above the rate of inflation, you're losing money. So the university this year, they want to give a three percent raise to everybody, three percent across the board to everyone. That sounds fair, doesn't it? Everybody gets not 3%. a raise. It's not a raise. It's not even a cost of living. Well, forget increase. about that. Let, let's say well, let's say it was eight percent. Let's say it was the number of inflation. There's a reason there's no flat tax in America. It sounds fair. Everybody pays the same amount of tax. 
There's a reason we have a progressive system. So what the union went back and said, look, here's what you're going to do. Everybody paid $100,000 or less is going to get a little bit more. And everybody who's above $100,000 or above is going to get a little bit less. We're going to make it progressive from the mean. Now, the, 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 the owners don't want to do that because they're worried about the rich guy who's making $250,000 a year who might leave if he gets a little bit less. This is Warren Buffett's point about coddling the wealthy. But the guy who's making $40,000 a year, okay, if he, only, if he doesn't get, he gets his 3%, you know, or he doesn't get a little bit more, he's got to make a decision in real terms as he's taking the kids to a movie and a pizza on Friday night. So help the guy at the bottom who's making less, who's doing a good job. I'm not talking about rewarding people who are, who are dead wood, okay? But if people are doing well, give them a little more and help them rise. Right. And people who don't need any more or are going to just going to buy another Porsche. That's ridiculous. Of course, they wouldn't do that because they're afraid they might lose the, pe- the high performers, which is absurd. But the point is the purchasing power impact on the guy at 250 means nothing to change, doesn't change his life one bit. But the guy at 40K, when he gets a little bit more, it's an impact. It's a huge impact because he has, he has less purchasing power. And that's my point. But Steve Forbes will tell you that you're wrong. No, Steve Forbes is wrong. And that a flat wrong. tax is really the way to go. No, and he's I wrong. think it's a, But why? Why <laughs> should the rich have every possible loophole? Right. The, the no, 10%, Steve Forbes is wrong. The 10% for Steve Forbes, I think he was right. There were no, no loopholes. There were no deductions and no loopholes. No no, so someone the... who's making a million dollars a year is going to pay 10%. Someone who's making $40,000 a year is going to make 10%. The government's going to get it. 4000 No, this is completely... Exactly. You missed my point. The, 10, the impact of 10% on a guy making $10,000 a year, let's, dra- let's dramatize it. A $10,000 a year janitor is going to pay 10%. He's losing $1,000 from his $10,000. And a millionaire is going to lose $100,000. He's still going to have $900,000 left. Who do you think is being greatly impacted? More negatively impacted. Which millionaires do you know pay a hundred thousand dollars? Right, they taxes? don't. They have every every no, but you're missing my deduction. Point. They pay Stay zero. With the point. The, the millionaire, his life doesn't change. <laughs> his life, yeah, his life doesn't change because he's the, not paying any taxes. Paying the, taxes. The ten, he's not paying any no, taxes. You're talking about a flat tax. If you implement the, I am. No, the the, the ten thousand dollar janitor just lost a thousand dollars. Okay. All right. I think the ten thousand dollar janitor is going to be under the taxable rate, no matter what you do. No, you didn't. No, the you whole didn't point say that. is to try. You said it's a flat tax to everybody. Well, okay, but I. All right. You, you, you see, that's what I'm saying. You're, that's why the flat tax will never pass because it is completely unfair to the to the poor or the struggling. You can't have a flat tax and say except for these people. Okay, <laughs> that's not a flat tax. If you're talking about getting rid of loopholes, at which which is uh, you will get, I'm totally with you on that. Get rid of loopholes. Absolutely, right. keep the progressive system and get rid of the loopholes. But the solution is not a flat tax. That will hurt the poor more than All anyone. Right. Well, Stan, you should run. You, please, please tell us your solution one day, and we'll. I just and, and I'm going to vote for you. He believes in trickle down <laughs> economics well, too. All that ca- campaign finance report. <laughs> get rid of Citizens United, but that's a whole other conversation. Well, that's a good start. <laughs> that's well, that's a good why start you have that, the reason you have the loopholes is because of, is because of <laughs> right. money in politics. The lobbyists, right? right. Absolutely, right. right. Money in politics. But don't be seduced by the fat tax fairness idea. That's not fair. That's a seduction. That's that's a farce. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. So. Just to recap for a second before I go into this last question, I think we've hit on a couple of important points. One is diversify. You never know what's going to happen to one aspect of your field. Diversify. Two is if you make a dollar, don't spend a dollar fifty. Listen to Stan's dad's <laughs> advice and get your passbook from your local corn exchange and put in of every dollar you make, save fifty cents, and then never send your spend your principal. Uh, the other thing is. Make sure that your interest rate is higher than the rate of inflation. You know, don't leave a large amount of money in a slush fund checking account if it could be making two, three, four, or five percent someplace else. I just want to point. I just want to point something out here. Uh, just I don't want to get anybody upset, but 
I trust Stan. Stan turned me on to something. You know what it is, Stan. I bought a thousand shares of it. I'm doubling my money. Oh, tell us what it is. Come it's, on. It's, no, no, it's 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 incredibly safe. I couldn't believe it. And I did all the research and Stan said, you need to look at this and look at it hard. And I did. I started out because I didn't trust Stan and bought a hundred <laughs> shares. And after like two months, I went, this is, this is unbelievable. So I went ahead and, and why aren't the, you going to share? Uh, up, up why aren't you going to share that I, I, information up, with it, our listeners? No, no, let, me, to, now, let, me, to, let me just I say something. So, thousand don't, shares. You're giving Stan way too much credit um, because Stan pays somebody a 0.88 basis points a year for someone to manage his portfolio. And this person does this for a living. And so I am the beneficiary of a very good financial advisor. And I have passed that knowledge on to my dear friend, Steve. Which is a good well, what point. What about the rest of us? What no, about no, the rest no. of us? I, well, I, there's the we most don't important. Know. We, we haven't heard this. So I guess we're not Stan's good Stan friends. Stan has just, well, I had him liquored up. <laughs> Stan made the be, makes the best point of the show so far. Uh, if when you can and you have some money that you need to try to maintain or worry about, hire a professional to maintain it for you. Now, I do have one. I'll give you one that, that David has already helped me out with. Okay, Game so stock? yeah, David Jocks. I convinced David Jocks <laughs> to, to open. Can I say? Can I say it, David? I don't know what it yes, was. Yes, you do. Well, okay, so I say uh, it. I'll, I'll cut it. Okay, if I can. somebody, somebody much smarter in finance than me. So I'm not taking credit. Told me that I could get four percent on my liquid savings, which was sitting in Wells Fargo, losing money, getting zero point zero two percent at a bank. FDIC insured, for your knowledge, Ellen, up to $250,000 by one of the largest financial institutions in the world, Goldman Sachs, has a bank called Marcus Bank. I put all of my cash into Marcus, okay? It is FDIC insured, and I'm currently collecting, ready for this, 4.75%. And everybody who... I send a link to a specialized link who opens an account with even just $5 will give me that rate, rate for another three months. So David opened an account. Two of my other friends opened an account. So now I have 4.75, which is one point above their base rate of 3.75, right, until July. And if Ellen opens an account and Steve opens an account with just $5, I'll receive, and so will you receive those extra points. Well, send interest. us the link. I'll be happy. Darling. To, I'll be happy to do yeah. that. And I'll be happy. Yeah, I got to do so that. excited. I got so excited about your stock tip. I forgot that. So right. go ahead and send, send me that link, Bernie. I'm going to send we you the link both. right after the Listen, show. Listen, Bernie, we and, want and both. So again, I didn't come up with this. Uh, back to relationships. When you meet somebody who's smart, you have experience with them, and you can trust them because you have repetitive, trustworthy experiences. That is a commodity that is precious. It has to be deeper than just transactional. It has to be a real friendship, right? And real trust. And so I'm happy to share the Marcus. But again, that's not quite keeping me above inflation, but it's better than 0.01. And it's I have complete liquidity and an FDIC insurance. And a toaster. And a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> so this is so here's the thing what i learned the rich know how to get rich the rich know how to stay rich so talk to the rich or behave like oh i've rich, got i've got a rich not. story for you i have a ri i needed i needed thirty thousand dollars i want to do some renovations and i went to my bank and i i went to get um, a home equity line of credit and they said no we're not we're not going to do it you know thirty thousand is not worth our time um, and I said, well, uh, let's just say that you would do it. What were you going to charge me? And at the time, the rate was like 3%. And uh, the banker looked at me and said, you've been here a long time with us. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you uh, a HELOC at $150,000. And I went, I don't want $150,000. This is the point of how the rich get richer. And he said, I know you don't want that. You're going to write us a check for 120,000 and pay 120,000 off. You're going to get your 30,000 that you're asking for and we're going to give it to you not at 3% but at half a percent. 
<laughs> that's how the rich get go. richer. If you don't, if you don't need the money, they're happy to give it to you. You know, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's really smart. I like that. I like that a lot. You know, and I just want to say one more thing before we get on to our last question, and that is, you know, we're talking about. What, what what they're saying? The rate of inflation is eight percent, right? No, right it's now, or six, something like it's that. Six right now. Six, uh, okay, let's five. say it's six right now. Okay. Well, you know, people need to understand that that is an average, and it's that it's taken on a lot of different um, bases. Uh, you know, like this: there's groceries involved, there's there's uh, car prices involved, there's insurance. You know, there's home prices, things like that, uh, energy prices, but. The bottom line is, is you go down to the Ralph's or Vons or Safeway or whatever your local grocery store is, those dozen eggs that you paid about three months ago, $3 for, are now $6. To me, that's an inflation rate of 100%. Right. Well, it tends what, where you're shopping, what you're buying, and whether you're clipping coupons. <laughs> that's true. I don't clip coupons. You that's should. That's the problem. But, but, but then again, I go to... I go to Trader Joe's and those eggs are $3. So, but things are ex more expensive. And I think it's more than 8%. Well, you know, I it's really interesting do. about what you're saying about that because most Americans uh, shop very badly. Most yeah. Americans own 5,000 things more than they own. You know, living in Europe for many, many years, I realized that Europeans do not own 47 pairs of shoes and 50 sport <laughs> coats and 17 suits. They just don't. And, um, clipping coupons is really a good idea. You can save hundreds of dollars a year on doing that. And um, the other thing is that, you know, well, Trader Joe's is um, a good example, but some things there are more expensive. Some things are less expensive. You sure. have to be careful. I mean, he, they're, fresh, they're fresh squeezed <laughs> um, blueberry juice is a little high, but um, <laughs> You know, my daughter, when she was bringing up her kids, I used to just like she worked full time and it was really hard for her to like shop economy wise. So she would buy ridiculous things like juice boxes. Well, if you buy like a three gallon thing of juice or you make orange juice out of, you know, concentrate or squeeze oranges or whatever, it's a hell of a lot different. And it probably costs a dollar a gallon than buying those juice boxes that come in plastic with a plastic straw rewrapped in plastic. And probably you're paying ten dollars a gallon for the same juice. But it's a, it's convenient. So I think a lot of us really have to look at the way we shop. Um, and figure out, okay, so, you know, the inflation, yes, it's out there, but let's shop smarter and we can save a lot of money, inflation or no inflation. Agreed. You know? I want to just uh, add a psychological dynamic. I want to congratulate Steve for actually acting on the, on the uh, closed-end mutual fund that I told him about at LDI and actually bought some. Because here's the thing I've learned, and I think this is true, most people are have a very difficult time making a financial decision like even taking that one dollar a week from that dollar or that small amount of money that steve talked about people for whatever reason i don't understand the psychology can't quite when it comes to money and the bankers know this once they get your money very few people move banks change banks buy things or sell things. They, they're they just reluctant to do it. So kudos to Steve. He bought CSQ. Yeah, you know, you'd have to sell me really hard on a mutual fund. Mutual funds are, um, I don't know, I have a broker that called it a hat and a hat and will never put any money into it. So um, it depends what you're looking for, I guess. But, you know, and, and also about interest rates going up. Some people are hating this because they're, they, anybody who's in the borrowing game, I mean, that's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, as we that's mentioned right. last week. They got that's caught right. in, the, you know, but for somebody who's got a hundred grand in a Marcus account and it's going up every week, they're happy. But somebody who's looking to borrow money for whatever project it is, is not happy. When I bought my apartment in Brooklyn in the 70s, believe it or not, and I thank God did not have to get a loan, interest rates were 18% sure. right. for what, mortgages. What, what decade was that? Ellen. It was about 1981. Yeah, that, right, yeah. that was a crazy. That's when I, and crazy that's when I bought my first co-op in New York City. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was um, it was a long story. But first, that was I got my apartment. My I was a graduate student at Brooklyn College getting my master's degree. And my father had to co-sign the, the, not even the loan, the lease. So when it came time for the 
paperwork to come around for the co-op. They didn't even want to give it to me because I was a student. My father had co-signed the lease to rent the apartment. They said, you're in no position to buy it. I said, how do you know? So they had to, by law, give it to me. I bought the apartment. The insider rates were great. And I said to my father, could you bring the money in pennies and make them count it? <laughs> I said, how about even dollars? Just bring a suitcase full of dollars. So let me make Which a little delineation about, about the fund that I did recommend to Steve. So there's, there's investments can be growth oriented, and that's a, that's a long-term thing. What I recommended to Steve was a fund that is, that is a income based uh, concept. So it's a dividend paying fund. So it only invests in instruments that pay dividends and it pays the dividend every month, right? And so every month there's going to be a declared dividend. That's the price of the individual. And then you get a 1099 dividend thing to report the tax. Of course, yeah, yeah. of course, exactly. of course. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay. but I have a lot of funds like that. They, the, that stands fund is not the no, only fund. No, there's hundreds, thousands the of them. Right, 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 there's right, dividend right, funds. Right. Dividend funds is something my brother told yep. me about. Many years ago, and it made a lot of sense to me. And I've been in mostly dividend funds. But that that being said, I think we, you know, we're kind of running out of time. So let's get this last question. All right, let's roll. All right. Like the last ten, question is interesting. Um, it says, um, um, "What does it say?" It says, "Do you work with the same people all of the time, and why do they hire you?" Well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> That's but, the big question. Well, soft, here's you know, Yale School. Well, the, well, another thing, you know, it's like it's relationships and um, like the Yale School of Drama, NYU, Carnegie Mellon, you know, you go there and you make friends and you make colleagues and you start working with people and your soft skills sell you on being a part of this group. And then that group goes off and they come to New York and they do their first little off-Broadway show and then they do their second little off-Broadway show and then their name is Julie Taymor and she's doing puppetry <laughs> from, you know, um, wherever she's doing puppetry from, a Bali, and your name is Don. On Holder and you have worked with her and you've made 39 cents on her puppet shows. And then she says, oh, Disney wants me to do this thing called the Lion King. Do you want to light it for me? And mm, 25 years and many productions later, they're still doing the Lion King. And yes, they will still work together forever. And I bet if Julie went back to Don now and said, I'm going to do a shadow puppet show and I can pay you $39 and 45 cents to do the lighting because it. it's going to be free. And he would definitely right, do it back to my because point. of the relationship. No, yes. No, back to my point. Cause, well, cause he <laughs> yes. invested my your time. Point. He invested, yes. Sometimes you have to work for 39 cents. Yes. But there, not, but there was no, but there was no, they invested time in each other. There was no loss. He was never going to lose anything. You know, if Lion King didn't happen and they went through it and he got his thousand dollar fee, he didn't, wasn't going to lose any of his principal. He was making a good investment. Right. as it turns out. No, I took, um, I took a big know, risk and, and I got lucky. Right, right. You were lucky. Um, a friend of mine took a big risk like that too with a friend who wanted to do a big, some kind of I, IPO. And when it went big, they made big, but it could have turned into nothing. Um, you never know. That's, cap um, that's capitalism. I do think, that's right. And But I think about working together is that, yeah, my, to answer this question, I think that it's because of relationships that you make early on in your career and you keep working with those people and they hire you because you've got a joint experience. You've got a joint vocabulary. It's comfortable and you do, you work well together. Um, and as an older designer that I know once said, everyone I know is dying or retiring. Who's going to hire me now? Right. Well, that happens. You know? That happens, which is why you want to build right. some principle so you can have some dividend and some passive income right. later. That's why you want to so diversify it. It's why you want to diversify and not just work with those same four people. <laughs> well, that's a re I was going to make oh, I was going to make that point. Like like anything else, it can become insular. It can become incestuous. And so anything if you swim in the same water all the time, right? It's good to have fresh blood, it's good to have fresh eyes, it's good to look I, I you know, I was once called by a doctor a novelty seeker. Right, and, and Stephen Rosen called me the George Plimpton of, of of lighting, and I kind of said that's an that's very apropos for me. But I think that sort of seeking new newness, thinking novelty is healthy. Not to say that those relationships are, are very very valuable, but at the same time, it's a yin and yang. You can have that; it's beautiful, good result, and at the same time, seek new novel experiences as well. You know, it's interesting because. You know, it's like, I mean, Stan and I tried a project once and we didn't lose any of our own money on it. We just lost a thousand hours. Um, we had a brilliant idea that we should have UF at LDI and that we should have um, 
courses at LDI that already existed. We would pick three or four of our fabulous LD Institute courses every year and offer UF credit. And it seemed like a no brainer. And the kids would come, they would come to LDI. Timing was off. Maybe the timing was wrong. I don't know, because now there's like, anyway, but we worked, it took like two years of getting it through our legal and their legal. And it finally was all ready to go. And we put it on like two or three years and it never worked. Never really took off. It never took off. Right. Um, I think, uh, I don't know why. I still don't know why. And we invested a lot of time in that. We did. Um, fortunately, we did not invest but that's, any but that's of anybody's in, that's principle. Inventing, you know, that's what. Thank that, God for that. You know, that's, <laughs> right. I would say something. I, I'm glad you brought that up, Ellen, because there's something to be said about the dyna. I'm, I think some things should be capitalistic and some things should be socialistic. And like, I don't want to buy my car from a socialist country. I want the auto companies to compete and build better cars. Right. And, and innovation is risk. And when you try to innovate, sometimes it's going to fly and sometimes it's not. And I think it depends upon, you got to have the stomach and the energy to take a risk. And uh, I, that's what I've learned in my life. Sometimes they've worked out, seems to us like a great idea. It didn't catch. Okay. We're going to end off this joint episode of Artistic Finance and Light Talk with a Light Talk lightning round. And you can only answer it with one sentence. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Here we go. You wake up in the morning, you find $10,000 under your pillow, and it's not coming from the tooth fairy. What are you going to do with that money? Give it to my financial advisor and say, I want it to make passive income for the rest of my life. All right. Steve, what are you going to do with the money? Pay off any debt that I have. Very good. Very good. And uh, <laughs> Ellen, what are you going to do with the money? I'm going to put it in an FDIC insured highest interest rate CD I can get. That's right. And I am going to buy as much vodka as possible. Ah. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to artistic finance and light talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website at lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk or Artistic Finance Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate the Snoot Group with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase, will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. The Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sisters coming to you from all across North America and the Bermuda Triangle. And remember, Stan can be trusted. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning for our sixth anniversary show. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye-bye. That's it for this week's episode. Thank you to the Lumen Brothers and Sister for boldly going where no lighting designers ever go. So what did you think? Did you enjoy the episode? Let me know out on the socials at Artistic Finance or find me on LinkedIn. We have an Artistic Finance page and I'm there as Ethan Stimel. A challenge to anybody listening who hasn't left us an Apple podcast rating or review Please do so to keep us ahead of the Light Talk podcast in number of reviews. It can be a little tricky finding out how to leave a review, but it's actually quite simple. All you do is find Artistic Finance on Apple Podcasts, scroll to the bottom of the episode list, and you'll see ratings and reviews. Tap a star rating, and that's it. It can take less than 30 seconds. However, if you don't have 30 seconds to spare, or if you're a fan of Light Talk and you don't want to see us overtake them in reviews, but you still want to help us here at Artistic Finance, consider becoming a patron. You can pledge monthly or yearly, and you can cancel any time. 
To become a patron and access our upcoming episodes with several lighting designers and a costume designer and an episode about pricing out a previous station, join up by visiting patreon.com slash artistic finance. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.